Welcome to the Kerrville Bible Church Podcast, where we seek to encourage and equip you for the work of ministry by taking a pastoral look at a variety of biblical and theological topics. Stay tuned until the end of the episode to learn how you can submit a question for us to answer on the podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Toby Baxley. Your host, joined in studio today with uh, by Scott Christensen, Murray Van Gundy, and uh, rejoining us today after a brief bout of, uh, what probably wasn't brief from your perspective, but uh, br- bout of sickness is our uh, our fearless uh, pastor, uh, Chris McKnight. So um, thankful to all be together uh, today, and uh, we're we're revisiting. We're we're tagging on to last week's episode. If you haven't listened to that, you can go back and listen to the first part of this discussion, where or or the last part of the last uh, episode where we talked about the age of accountability, and um, it really brought up some more questions uh, that I had on the way to lunch after we recorded that episode, and I thought it'd be good to just kind of piggyback on that and and go forward and, and talk about some of these other topics. So uh, just as a, a, a recap, let's, can we just talk about what, uh, what the age of accountability is, where it came from, um, and, and then we'll go on from there. Anybody? So Silence fell upon so the roof. <clears throat> where did it come from? Where did it come from? I don't, I don't think from? we know the answer to that. I don't. I don't know historically when this Scott doctrine knows. when this doctrine came on the scene. Uh, we looked at that little uh, God answers pri- <coughs> primer. I looked at that this morning, and they didn't touch on that at all. Uh, as far as uh, the phrase itself, the time, you know where where this came from. Um, I think I think it overlaps with so many other doctrines, right? The doctrine of election doctrine of uh, Romans 1, you are without excuse because of mm-hmm. creation. It overlaps with um, both willful sin on one side and the ability to choose or reject Christ on the other side. You know, just the mental ability to understand the gospel. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I think it's a very complex topic, and the Bible says almost nothing about it directly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet we all feel like that there is one, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the consensus, that right. there is an age of accountability for every person as to when they are now responsible for their sin. They're accountable mm-hmm. for their sin, which means they have to know that they've sinned. It has to be a willful sin. Um, and and parallel to that, accountable for accepting or rejecting the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, this even ties into, uh, I think it ties into people who have never heard of the gospel, it ties into mentally incapacitated. Uh, it's, it's a parallel to all of that. Uh, and, and I think we would all say, well, you know, the judgment, the great, great white throne judgment is going to be, books are going to be open, and we're going to be judged based on our deeds. And so this is why we all hold to infant salvation, because an infant is not going to have sin in those books. There will be nothing to judge them for as far as personal, willful sin. But on the other side of this whole equation, and that that website talked about it, is we've got this issue of imputed sin, original Mm -hmm. sin. You know, there are no innocent people. Jesus was the only innocent person. And, And so... Babies are not innocent. They, they, they have inherited, imputed sin in their being, you know, from conception. And it's just a matter of time until that sin works itself, it works itself out. out. <laughs> and so I guess what we're really talking about is, you know, for each person, when does that, where is that line where that, that inbred sin expresses itself? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll just go on record to saying I think it can be really early. Personally, I don't. Y'all didn't get into this last week. I don't think it, nobody really threw out an age, but I think it can be as early as five years old. I think it can be as late as ten, eleven, or twelve. I mean, yeah. there's right. such a range here to me, depending on the child and the person and the circumstances. So, I mean, I, I've I've shared this before. I I can vividly remember my first willful sin in my life. I was five years old. So you stole something. I stole right? something, and I knew exactly. I knew it was wrong, and I, I, I was sneaking to do it, and 
I thought I was, you know, I wasn't a very good thief. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, I, I, that stands out in my memory. And, and, uh, and so I, I think back to that, it's like, was I accountable at that point? You know, if I, can, if I can knowingly sin, if someone had explained the gospel to me at five years old, would I have been able to understand it enough to be saved? Mm-hmm. Spurgeon says a five-year-old can be saved. Well, that means a five-year-old can be accountable then, doesn't it? Yeah. Or does it? <laughs> Well, and, and Jonathan Edwards gives gives uh, you know, I mentioned this last week gives a, a you know a, an example of a five year old little girl during the Great Awakening that All had right. a powerful powerful conversion experience mm. and started preaching mm. you know to other people you know telling people about Christ at five you know five years old so yeah in, in that article it, it mentioned the age of twelve and I thought wow that's way too high. Yeah, for um, sure. I, I think most children have a pretty good grasp of of their sin and of their accountability at a much earlier age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I guess some of the uh, this article mentions. Uh, you said twelve. I read somewhere thirteen. Thirteen bar mitzvah. That's yeah. bar mitzvah. Right. right. And right. That's so, but that's I mean that's an extra biblical right. uh, even concept the Jewish uh, Jewish tradition. Right. Um, so, but that would put. That put somebody in junior high ministry before they they've reached age of accountability. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean it'd be uh, nice, wouldn't it, if God <laughs> spelled it out and just said, "By this time, if you if you have not repented and believed, like you are now going to be held accountable." You know, if you were to right. die, you're going to be held accountable. But that that's the question: is when are you held accountable? And we've said that that's different can be different for everybody, right? right. It's not a it's not there's not a number. Yeah, that probably right. the Typical Christian wants to hear a number. Give me a number. Yeah. Right. For what? For my own security, like for mm-hmm. my own kids, or for like when? What do I do with my child who died when they were three? What do I do with my child who died when they were eight? And you know, and I think that those are real. Or struggles. the children that are living right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And I think this. I mean, y'all probably talked about it last week. I think this is why it's not spelled out in the Bible because God wants every set of parents to have a sense of urgency. Hmm. You know, we talked about the groundwork for our witness in Acts 1, and one of those four points, it was uh, credibility, power, urgency, and, and duration. And, and I think God has left has been silent on this subject so that parents are not complacent, so that parents are not lackadaisical, mm-hmm. uh, so that parents are teaching their kids the Bible and the gospel from the moment they enter into that home, almost right. I mean, you're starting to talk talk to them about it. it there's no <clears throat> there's no timeline. There's no reason to say you can't wait. You got to wait till here to start talking about Jesus to your kids. You know, right. uh, and so I think God wants every set of parents to to not know on a child by child basis, so that those parents have a sense of urgency in their prayer and their evangelism of their child. And in the reality of life, that there's no guarantee this child is going to see tomorrow, mm-hmm. right? We have no guarantee that our children are going to grow up and outlive us. Uh, and so, with all of that coming into play, I think it gives parents a sense of I got to get, I got to get on, I got to get with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think of I think of the the incident in the Gospels when. Um, when, you know, all the children were flocking to Jesus and, and, and the disciples saw them as a nuisance and, and Jesus said, no, let them come unto me, right. you know, for such belong the kingdom of God, yeah. you know. And so the, there's almost in Jesus's words there an urgency there that, no, they need to see, you know, that that I love them, that mm-hmm. that they need to to embrace me as their savior. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I think there's there's that implication in what he says about that. And a seeking of him, right? There's a, there's a drawing to him of, of that picture, you know, mm-hmm. them coming. And then, you know, I think that parents need to also know, yes, Chris, we need to, you know, grow our kids up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And we, we preach the gospel to them. We live it in front of them. It's, you know, it's not just words. It's obviously, I think, in parenting, it's even more our actions, how we're able to be transparent and honest and ask for forgiveness ourselves, live that gospel out. They see it in our, in our, in our marriages and they see it in our parenting, but also that parents need to 
realize that that's their responsibility, but their responsibility isn't to get their kids to pray a prayer. Their responsibility isn't to get their kids to a junior high camp and let the junior high camp take care of it. Or their, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And, right. or, or to Awanas and Awanas will take, like do your responsibility as far as the Bible has described it. And then you have to trust the Lord because that is a hundred percent the Lord's decision. Right. 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 And yet, you know, I think as as Calvinists, we don't want to go so far as to as to ever be complacent or lackadaisical about about pressing our kids with the gospel mm-hmm. and the repent and believe, repent and believe, you know, and and pressing them with that. And so, I don't know if you guys ever come across this J. C. Ryle, who I know y'all know of, eighteen hundreds uh, English pastor, uh, well known, great writer, great preacher. I think more or less a Calvinist. You know, maybe he was a four-point Cal. I'm not sure, but he was he was definitely Reformed. He wrote a paper one time about parents evangelizing their children. And in this paper, I, I remember what stands out to me was he basically says, now don't take this wrong, don't, don't overreact, but he basically says, parents, it's all up to you. It, uh-huh. it, it's, it, he, just like, he just wants to impress upon the parents their responsibility to evangelize their kids. And just like you're saying, not the youth camp, not the youth pastor, not the church's primary responsibility. Parents, it's your responsibility. Mm-hmm. And he even goes so far in this, in this essay to, to argue that in God's economy, um, more or less, it, it depends on the parents and, and how God generally saves children. Mm-hmm. The means. The means. Yes. And uh, that 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 God's primary means is mom and dad, yeah. uh, and to he just you know lays that on heavy and just basically says you need to embrace it, you need to acknowledge it, and and that this is per- pretty much what parenting is all about. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, you, that's why God's given them to you. That's right. For yeah. that that's why they're there. Years. That's right. We I mean, you know with people who have come to faith that their parents were complete scoundrels, um, but it th- that's a hurdle. That's really a hurdle that they have to overcome, especially right. if they have a you know a abusive father or something. That, that overcoming that right. kind of that view of God as father when theirs has been so so bad and <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, but we know it happens. But yeah, I mean, I, I can just see that that's that's a primary means of evangelism for our. For our children is is right. raising them up in a, in a right. godly home. And let's take it one step further. Not just parents, dads. Yeah, dads. I mean, even Ephesians six, he doesn't say parents. He says fathers. Mm-hmm. And you know, our our modern culture wants to soften that translation or change it even. But Paul says, fathers, bring your children up. And so I, I think biblically, that's you know that's what we see in the, in the Bible is it's the father's responsibility to teach his kids, evangelize his kids, disciple his kids. Wife is obviously crit- critical and alongside and a partner in all of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the buck stops with the dad. Mm. It you know that that's where it, that's where it lands. Yeah. And uh, this is what J.C. Rowell's trying to do in his generation, and how much more is it even needed? In oh our, my gosh! In our yeah. generation. I mean, should we be surprised then at all? Yeah. Right? The the lack of true born again evangelical Christians in our culture in American Christianity, given the the breakdown of the family unit, which is right. lack of fathers. Right. 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 Yeah, there's. St- I mean, you've probably seen them, Murray. These statistics that say if a child comes to faith, um, there's a pretty minuscule percentage of uh, chance that that the whole family will will come to faith in Christ. And then, uh, if a mother comes to faith, then that that percentage is higher. But if a father uh, comes to faith in Christ, it's 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 night and day different right. uh where whereas the the whole family will end up you know mm-hmm. walking with the lord i mean let that be let that sink in and let that be an indictment to us as men and fathers in this room and to our church and to people who are listening who are not following christ who are dads let that be an indictment mm-hmm. on you that you are held accountable to that as what yeah. you would, per what you just said. Right. Yeah. Do we think that <clears throat> admonition in, that. in Ephesians six was corrective? I mean, it has it has a sense of corrective uh, 
kind of disciplined, you know, because men are like like our father Adam are are given to passivity mm, right. um, and, and and resultant anger. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I would say that that um, every role that God assigns to men and women is also going to be the areas of weakness right. that they're going to have in their sin nature that Satan particularly is going to attack. Right. You know, both on an individual level and and in a cultural way as well. And, and and we see that happening in our culture. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned this about about men because I think that explains the household baptisms and and whatnot that you see mm-hmm. in yeah. in, the, in the Book of Acts. You know, because you have fathers who particularly did have a, a, a higher respect and authority and 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 whatnot in the first century than they do, especially today. Um, but I think that that the power. Of a father's testimony to his family yep. is one of the primary means yep. that God uses mm-hmm. to draw that family to Christ. Did, did y'all remember the book Tender Warrior? Did y'all ever read that? Stu Weber, <clears throat> back in the was nineties, late nineties. Uh, Stu Weber's pastor out Oregon, I think, and he wrote a it's pretty good selling book called Tender Warrior. And it's, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. And one of the phrases he uses, I think it's the title of an entire chapter. It's called The Power of Dad. Mm. And it's what we're talking about. Mm. And it's just that whole age, that whole age old, old dynamic of you wait till your father gets home. You know, the kids <laughs> cutting up with mom and all that kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and it's just like, and, and some women even get frustrated with that. It's like, I've been telling them all day, and you walk in the door and they straighten up, you know? And this is like, pow, power of dad. And, uh, uh, it's re- really profound, and you know, I think that's what we're talking about, and and it's why it's why our culture is in the mess that it's in. Yep. It's why our inner cities are in the mess that they're in. It's mm-hmm. why we have a crime problem where, it, on a daily basis, people are getting shot in Philadelphia and Chicago, mm-hmm. and I mean it's war zones. People mm-hmm. are being killed every single day because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of homes without fathers, and. Uh, I mean, it's incredible. You don't even have to be a really great father, but just present. Yeah. Just present. <laughs> it makes a difference. <laughs> Changes yeah. everything yeah. about poverty yeah. and imprisonment and drug use and all these things. If they're yeah. just a sober, working dad present, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah, life Yeah, that's the starting point, and then move up from there. <laughs> right. Uh, a dad who, who is a, a, obviously a follower of Christ, and right. he is a... Not a not a closet Christian, not a cultural, but he like living for G. I mean, just yeah. look at how the stats. Were mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. And then we balance crazy. that with none of that's a guarantee. And that then at the every, end of the day, that every still child's up to the Lord. Lord. That's, that's right. right. Still, still up to the Lord, Lord. and election yeah. and calling and yeah. timing and all those things. Yeah. So. Well, I have a question then about um, you know we were talking about children and and babies and uh, we're looking at the. Uh, the ability to recognize the ability to sin, which is early, but also uh, there has to be some awareness, right, of having sinned. Uh, you know, I remember one of our children, I won't name names, but uh, learning to crawl, and we had a transition between our living room and our kitchen, and we didn't want uh, this child going into the kitchen because they're. There's dangerous stuff in there. We had nice carpet, and then the kitchen was a just a roll, uh, you know, linoleum floor. And uh, one day, this child was wa- was crawling toward the kitchen with no, no, you know, don't go in there. And they looked at us and looked at that floor <laughs> and looked back at us and with their. With his eye, his. Okay, it was, it was a boy. It was one of the boys. We, can, we narrowed okay. it down to two. We narrowed, we narrowed, okay, we narrowed it down to two. Okay, it was Garrett. Don't get the name. It was Garrett. Oh, darn it. <laughs> we, we forgive the, you, Garrett. Our, our prototype. Uh, he was looking at us when he put his hand out on that <laughs> tile floor. Like, story. what are you going to do about that's it? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So that was his first uh, was his first disciplinary action. <laughs> but, but, you know, I don't think he's... I mean, we're talking about like 18 months, maybe. He's not old enough to perceive. He's old enough to sin, obviously, yeah. but he's not old enough to perceive, oh, I just transgressed God's law. Right. And so um, what is the difference then? How do we, how do we tell the difference between uh, a, a child who's not convicted of sin uh, um, and one who is like maybe... Uh, 
uh, hardened, hardened to sin, you know, conscience, whose conscience is maybe seared. Mm-hmm. I got a story from a doctor friend in Tennessee that uh, had a family that believed in zero discipline, and they brought a four-year-old. He had never had his hair cut, you know, like a little Samson or something, and this, uh, he'd only eaten junk food chocolate, whatever he wanted, because parents gave him whatever he wanted, no, no discipline. And I remember this, this Christian guy, and I remember him telling us that and this this little four-year-old was practically a monster. Mm. He mm-hmm. was he was basically, you, you could not deal with him without restraints, without, I mean, but zero discipline, zero good habits at home, and by four. Yeah. I mean, he's punching people, kicking people, spitting on people, saying all kinds of vile things, you know, just out of control. It's like Meaning heartbreak. what are we capable of, right, without yes. restraints? Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's what and it didn't, yeah. I mean, that was his whole point is yeah. by, by four. Yeah. And we think of little two, three-year-olds as sweet and innocent, and it's like, oh, Mm-mm. no. no. <laughs> you give them free reign, and you will have an animal on your hands. At an mm-hmm. early yeah. age, yeah. we had a neighbor teaches. like that in East Texas. I called him Thor. <laughs> it was like a little, little three or four year old kid with long blonde hair, and uh, he wielded a hammer and uh, <laughs> a real hammer, <laughs> oh and God. did some did some damage. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, okay. So, um, you know, I was talking. This raised some questions last week after we uh, wrapped our podcast, and I think. You know, what we're talking about when I think a lot of people, when they ask about the age of accountability, they're wondering, uh, it kind of goes hand in glove with this doctrine, if you will, or um, whatever you want to call it, of uh, do babies and children go to heaven? And Chris, you hinted at it earlier, um, but let's just kind of uh, discuss that and, and kind of see where that conversation goes. You had some, Scott, you had some uh, interesting insight uh, as we were discussing it on the way to lunch uh, last week. I did? Yeah, it was no. profound. I just no. don't remember it. <laughs> don't so you have to remind me what it was. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, where, where the, some biblical warrant for that notion comes from is, is really, really one passage. There's, a, there's another passage that may be somewhat supportive of it, but it, it comes from from Second Samuel chapter twelve, the story of course is David and his sin with Bathsheba of adultery. They they um, had had a child, uh, but God promised that child would die. And uh and so he was deathly sick and David went and prayed for the child. And um, and then finally, uh, finally the child died, and uh, and and David was practically inconsolable mm-hmm. while the child was still alive. But then once he was dead, he was fine, and the servants were a little flabbergasted by that. And um, you know, and, and he says, "What is this thing that you? Have? This is Second uh, Samuel chapter twelve, verse twenty-one." He says. Says, what is this thing that you have done while the child was alive? You fasted and wept, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now that he's died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So the key phrase there is that last phrase, um, and it is a little controversial, but uh, one interpretation is, is that David is saying, you know, he's died and he's left me and I can't bring him back again, but there will come a day where I will go and be with him. I will see him again, um, though he can't come back to me. Mm-hmm. And so there just seems to be the slightest hint there that what David is saying is is that he's in heaven. Yeah. And when I die and go to be with the Lord, I'll be with him as well. Um, is, that, is that, you know, a knockdown <laughs> argument, interpretation of that passage in, our, in, in support of this notion? No, um, I, I think it's rooted in some deeper things, you know, such as 
you know, God's mercy and love toward those who may not have that cognitive ability to process, for example, the gospel or the need to repent, the need to exercise faith. And and that gets us back to this age of accountability thing. There is another interesting passage in Jonah um, that that I think is worth considering. But again, it's it's not definitive in, in any way. If I can find that passage, um, it's in Jonah four. Where is that passage? I'm trying to find Jonah. <laughs> yeah, good luck finding Jonah. Yeah, right. Just to start with. <clears throat> Uh, Does anyone else have something to say about that passage? <laughs> well, I have a I question. I have, I have a question about uh, what the, David said about uh, "I will go to him, but he will not return to me." The Old Testament <coughs> believers had a different view of heaven than we do, right? I mean, uh, it was just like a place of the dead. They were talking about Sheol, right? Um, am I am I off base there? I mean. Uh, yeah, this gets into it's complicated. <laughs> the degree of, of progressive revelation and our and what sort of understanding Old Testament saints had of of heaven and those things. Yeah. I think a case can be made that, that there was some nascent view of heaven and the notion that to be present with the Lord was to you know, the whole what is called the beatific vision of, you know, coming face to face with God, you know, uh, was something that that was kind of ingrained in the Jew as part of that Aaronic blessing that we find in number six mm. and, and that sort of thing. So did they have as fully developed a view of, of heaven um, or even the resurrection and things like that that we have in the New Testament? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they spoke better than they knew as well when we consider, you know, the inspiration of Scripture and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, those, those, are, those are factors that you have to, to think about as well. Well, there's Enoch and Elijah, and yeah. they have that in, their, in yeah. their Scripture, and they knew that God, he was not, for God took him. God took him. Mm-hmm. And Elijah, there, I think there would have been the consensus that Elijah had been taken up into heaven. To, to be with the Lord, yeah. The whole the whole thing with Hades, Sheol, all of that. Those words have different meanings depending on the context. They're very complex. Um, that's a very complex subject. And at one level, they could just be talking about the grave. Mm-hmm. You know, where we would just say the cemetery. Mm-hmm. I'm going to the cemetery. I mean, that's that's what Sheol and Hades meant at one level. And then there, there's like different levels of meaning for those words, yeah. and, and context, you know, helps you figure yeah. that out. But um, I think I think there's a, a sense from from Enoch and Elijah uh, that that there had to be a concept of of God is in heaven, and um, we we go to be with Him uh, in some way. At the same time, they saw their life ending with with death. And they did not have much of a concept of what happens in heaven, <laughs> mm-hmm. what's going on on the other side of the grave for the for the soul, you know. So yeah. But uh, back to the Jonah, Jonah thing. Uh, last and, last and, verse of the Bible, of that yeah, book, right? Yeah, Jonah. Got a speaking to to Jonah. He says, "Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand persons?" Who do not know the difference between their right hand uh, or their right and left hand, as well as many animals. Um, again, this is this is a bit of a difficult statement to to un, unravel. Uh, some have suggested that there's you know that there's a kind of level of ignorance among the Ninevites that that um, you know that God is penetrating. Uh, by his grace and his mercy toward them, you know, is this speak of an age of accountability? No, I, I don't think directly. But if if there's a kind of ignorance here or a cognitive kind of backwardness, you know, as a result of the cultural, you know, environment that the Ninevites lived in, is that similar to, for example, 
a child who has a kind of ignorance of things, of spiritual things and, and realities that are just completely foreign to them or they cannot articulate in any kind of cohesive way. Um, I, I think there can be some parallels there if that's the way we interpret this this, mm-hmm. this passage. Um, and, and, and so, you know, these are thin threads to hang this age of accountability on. Yeah. But and I think that's why you have to look at some of the bigger pictures. And we we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that that, that this intersects God's, you know, providence, His election, you know, uh, you know, the extent of the atonement, even, um, you know, a number of different things that that come into play, you know, that that theologically <clears throat> may inform. You know, a, a doctrine of the age of accountability, right, but again, yeah. it, it's something that we have to be tread very carefully on. So we're certainly not in a position from uh, explicit Bible passages in order to be dogmatic about about an age of accountability or um, or the uh, children and babies going to heaven or, or special needs right, right individuals because we have no explicit statements to that effect in scripture and yeah. so it's an inference that we would have to draw from passages like this that are vague enough to not give us any definitive answers <laughs> yeah. on the question I think the strongest argument for do infants go to heaven is is the consistent message throughout the entire Bible that we're judged according to our deeds mm. yeah and that <clears throat> that is that is explicit and it's repetitive all through the Bible. It's in every genre. It's in every. It's essentially in every every book, every section of the Bible. And then it concludes in Great White Throne Judgment with an emphasis on that. There was a book. That's the Book of Life. And then there are books that are opened. And in those books that are opened are the deeds of everyone being judged, and they're judged explicitly according to what's in those books. And we know that the Great White Throne Judgment incorporates every lost person in the history of humanity. So it's a critical passage, I think. And to me, that is the strongest argument um, because it's it's clearly talking about actual deeds, Mm -hmm. actual Mm -hmm. works of evil, actual sins in, in Revelation 20, is that chapter 20? Um, it's what that's what it's talking about. It's not. It's not even. It's not even dealing with the theological topic of imputed sin. So it's not even in the context at all. Uh, and so, to me, that's that's the strong. That's where I hang my hat on. I believe babies are in heaven because uh, what otherwise? What would a just God be judging them for? Mm-hmm. It would just so their, be their, their potential lack of deeds, right? Their lack their, of evil deeds. Yeah, yeah, he would just be judging deeds. them for their potential sin, yeah. you know, not their actual sin. And that's not right. that's not the God of the Bible. Yeah, he doesn't judge people for potential sins. He judges for your actual sins. Yeah. So, so there's at some point that you're accountable for those actual sins, those <clears throat> deeds, right. is what you're right. That's right, yeah. and, and that's where Romans yeah. one would come in. Yeah. At some point, a person becomes that person who is without excuse. So whether you've heard the gospel or not is not the issue. You know, at some point through creation and conscience, you have crossed a line that you are no longer, you no longer have an excuse, which implies that there is an excuse until you cross that line, yeah. you know. And that's all, and that only God knows that. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I have argued before that there are, there are two main factors for moral accountability. One is a knowledge of good and evil, that is impressed upon our hearts via our conscience that in which God has written his law upon our hearts. That's Romans 2, uh, 14 and 15, I believe. Right. And, and, uh, and then secondly, a willful intention. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, that those, those two things become the basis for moral accountability. Right. That you are, you are willfully sinning against the knowledge that you have that what you are doing is wrong mm. and that you ought to be doing this, which is right. So, for example, you know that it's wrong to tell a lie and that it is that you have an obligation to tell the truth because God has written that upon your heart and you are willfully disregarding those things. And so that would include, a little bit off subject, but that would include someone in 
the you know in Brazil or in the Amazon you know indigenous tribe that's never heard the right there still Absolutely. like you said early on Chris yeah. that not one single person starts out innocent no one's innocent right that's a that's a starting point but what you're saying is that there is a knowledge right. and a willfulness and that includes people yeah. who will not hear or have not heard the gospel right. as we know it. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So people are going to be judged on the fact that you know, no, you know, somebody could stand in heaven and say, "Well, I never knew about this salvation in Jesus." You know, nobody told me about this. So why are you judging me? <laughs> but that's not going to be the basis of their judgment. You know, no one will stand in heaven and say, "Well, God, I didn't know that you, you didn't exist and that that's you right. and that you right. commanded me not to lie and steal and cheat and murder and all of that." Right. He goes, "Oh, yes, you did." Mm -hmm. You knew in your heart that I exist and that you have an obligation to me as your sovereign God uh, to obey these things, and you have willfully disregarded this, and that's the basis of your judgment. Mm -hmm. And Romans 1, it's not even, it goes even beyond that, is you haven't given me glory. Yes. You haven't given me thanks. Nor nor thanks, (laughs) that's right. So it's, it even goes beyond whether you murdered, stole, or whatever. You know, you, your omission you, of your omission of giving me glory that I deserve uh, and thanksgiving is so, grounds. Yeah. And, and in verse thirty-two, Paul says, even though they knew these things were even worthy of death, they not only did them, uh, did you know did them, but encouraged others to do the do same. Yeah. yeah, that's the passage that's we're going to be on this that's Sunday. That's the world we yeah. live in right now. Yeah. 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 That's, that's <laughs> calling evil good and good evil. That's mm. right. Okay, uh, good stuff. And uh, we kind of, Chris kind of teased at it earlier, but uh, the next couple of weeks we're going to uh, dive into a, a probably a two part series on heaven and hell and uh, the different uh, viewpoints of, of both of those. Um, and so hope you'll uh, listen in for that. And uh, thanks for listening today. And uh, I'd like to close us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are loving, holy, merciful, just, and gracious. And uh, whatever you ordain is right and good uh, because you are righteous and good. Um, and uh, we, we thank you for this. Uh, it's, it's comforting to know that uh, we who are, uh, who are evil uh, love children and babies, but uh, you love them infinitely more. And so uh, we can entrust them, uh, even though the, we can't be dogmatic about this, uh, this doctrine, we can, we can be uh, confident that, uh, that you, uh, you love them and uh, will do all things according to your wise and good and loving uh, control. And uh, Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Kerrville Bible Church Podcast. In future episodes, we would like to answer your biblical, theological, or pastoral questions. Send them to us via email at questions at kerrvillebiblechurch.org or leave us a text or voicemail at 830-321-0349.